Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim and Martina filling in for Kasim today. And our guest today is Ken. So Ken, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Yeah, I live up in Calgary, Alberta, so Western Canada. Um, I'm the COO of RV Snappad. It's a small family run business. So the CEO is my brother. The founder was my father. And the head of marketing is my other brother. So yeah, family affair. All right. So do you mind sharing exactly you know, what you do and what makes you better than your competition? <laughs> well, we, you know, back in late 2015, we came up with something called a permanent jack pad, which doesn't mean anything to most people because uh, unless you're an RVer, it's kind of what the heck is that, right? So if you are an RVer, you know that you need jack pads, which are just things that go underneath uh, leveling systems. So modern RVs have big metal feet on them that help them level in sort of any kind of terrain. So before us, people carried around stuff to put under them, which they call jack pads, which was, it could be a big slab of rubber. It could be a piece of wood. I've seen people using uh, cutting boards uh, under like $200,000 class A motor homes. <laughs> so um, yeah, we came along and designed, I guess you could call them shoes made out of rubber. So they actually snap onto these feet permanently rather than having to carry stuff around and yeah, we, we launched it kind of out of our garage in late 2015. We, we just came up with a sort of a one-pager. We had one uh, product and a couple of SKUs, um, and we made our first sale uh, like the next day. And then it just was sort of off from the races there. And now we have you know over 50 SKUs and 16 different feet, I think, types. But uh, yeah, the reason we're better than the competition is nobody has really done this before. So it was kind of a new category creation in the in the industry yeah that's amazing so what gave you this idea to come up with, um, with this product yeah it's uh <laughs> so the the genesis of this company actually started uh in early 1990s so my you know all the kids were we were still in school uh, my dad but and a co-founder of his who was an rvr they came up with a leveling product uh way back then but it was long before direct to consumer and the you know, and you know the internet right so they had to prototype the product and then roadshow it they had to go into major distributors so it could get into rv dealerships and retailers right what they didn't know while they were raising money to do that was um they were getting diluted out of their own company by the lawyer they had hired to help them raise money so that product is actually still a staple in the rv uh, industry today but as it popped uh they were basically told that they didn't own the company anymore and uh, sort of shuffled out as. So he came back to us uh, when all of us were sort of grown up and had our own careers. So I was in marketing before this. And he said, hey, I want to take another shot at the RV industry. And I've, we want to do something different, though, this time. So he said, let's try to do these. We call them mag pads because we're going to stick them to the feet with uh, magnets. That didn't work out, but luckily we kind of stuck with the idea until we found something that did. So, I mean, you know, you mentioned that it's a family business, which is really cool, right? And so I'm sure it's, there's been challenges as well because you're working yeah. with family. It's not always easy. So can you talk about some of those challenges, at least like in the early days and maybe even now sometimes with, I think a lot of family businesses, like sometimes it can be challenging because like it's your you know, family member, it's your father, it's your you know, siblings. Like, how do you guys manage those relationships from business to also, like, it's your family? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, on the good side of things, uh, everyone is intrinsically motivated to make the business work in a, in a way that you probably wouldn't get any other way, honestly. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of work internally to adjudicate the relationships of all of us who are the executives of the company to make sure that we're working together to open up lines of communication when there are disagreements because it's it's inevitable right when you're running a business no but you're never going to agree on everything all at the same time and there have been arguments to be sure but we always make sure that it's it's focused on the business and we're all trying to do the best that's for this company 
And I think we all ultimately understand that at the end of the day. So uh, when you all have the same goal, you all have the same motivation and you have a good foundational relationship, you can usually get past all that other stuff. So is it so essentially, you know, in starting your business, did you guys make sure it was all family because of the experience that your father had? You know, when you when he raised money, he got screwed over. You just said, OK, let's make sure we keep it a family business. It's all in the family. That way, nobody can take any control of this company. It's ours. Uh, there's definitely sort of a, a vein of that in what we've done. That said, when we started, you know, um, we had no money. It was completely bootstrapped. You know, there was friends and family gave us a little bit to get us off the ground. There's no VC funding here. Um, <laughs> so the only people who would work for the company were, were family. So I I was working, you know, full time at the time at a marketing agency. My youngest brother was SEO full time somewhere else. So I get home after work and or on the weekends and, and do what I could for free. And then my brother, who is now the CEO, uh, sold his house at the time so he could work for about a year without making any money at the job. So it's like when you have that level of uh, sacrifice, it's hard to ask anyone else um, to do it. And then as we got a little bigger, so you know, my mom actually pitched in at one point for customer service. My wife is not the head of customer service. Again, when you're growing really fast, but you still don't, you're, you're putting it all back into the business. You need people who are willing to jump aboard for less than <laughs> anyone else. It's hard to put up a LinkedIn ad for some of the jobs we had because like we're gonna pay you nothing and you're gonna work 60 hours a week Makes sense. so how are you able to leverage your marketing expertise when starting this company even today yeah so um i was the head of uh social media a uh, major agency here in in town and that kind of started as the basic like get more likes than followers and over time i became uh, the media buyer on facebook so i had that um, knowledge going in and so the two things I did early on that really helped us gain traction were uh, influencer seeding so I'd done a few of those programs for other clients and I knew that if we could get the product in the influencers hands it would add sort of instant credibility um, to us so that uh, we did that early and that we're, that's a full full-fledged program for us now it's a major major tentpole in our marketing strategy well, the other thing I did was leverage Facebook, which is actually a lot easier to do back in like 2016, kind of a different time. Uh, but even at like five or 10 bucks a day, which is all we could kind of afford for budget, because this product was was new and the value prop uh, caught on really quickly, it was a relatively easy product to uh, to market on Facebook. So we really got traction through those two um, tactics. Makes sense. So... Is a lot of your strategy, so it's more like affiliate marketing when you work with these influencers? Or like, what is that? Or what are these like, you know, um, agreements look like when you're working with them? Uh, we have various sort of agreements. A lot of it uh, starts at like product seeding. So we will contact someone and say, hey, do you want to try this product? We'll send it to you for free. And the AOV of our product is about 150 bucks. So it's a, it's a pretty significant giveaway. So if you say yes, we set up sort of a review it for us or do an installation video, let us know what you think, uh, post it on your site if, if you like it. Uh, but I'll, we see how that organic um, content gains traction if there's a good fit between the brand and the, and the creator and their audience, obviously. And then we can, we actually may build out ongoing relationship, retainer-based deals, things like that. So, can, what's the role of technology in your business right now? Uh, pretty substantial. So, we began life as direct to consumer, obviously. Um, our first website, uh, I don't know if it was a WordPress site or something with a free Shopify button on it, but we're now Shopify Plus. We have a full blown tech stack uh, behind that. So, it's Clavio, uh, Recart for, S for SMS. Um, there's probably half a dozen other <laughs> apps on there that I'm Forgetting, there's a lot of stuff in there. Obviously, uh, Slack is our communication channel. We were fully remote back in the day, so we were working from our homes or from, you know, coffee shops for a long time. And part of our team is now still partially remote. Uh, but I am always got the ear to the ground to th find things that can help us, be it in conversion rate optimization, be it in 
in improving uh, user experience. So there's a big sort of friction point in our product, it's compatibility. So we've made up this product um, and we've had to create the fitment database. We have over 10,000 RVs in that database now and more every day. So there was no, you know, thing we could go and plug into and say, well, this, this works with this. So um, we've built a lot of compatibility UX around that. So we have a LAN bot, which is a no code chat, which helps, gives people a series of questions through contingent logic and it can make a product recommendation. We have a search tool, but I'm actually looking deeply into the new AI stuff. I'm hoping at some point we'll have an AI bot that can query our database and run people through this contingent logic string sort of simultaneously in real language uh, and sort of uh, make that an even smoother experience. Definitely. So how do you view this bot really helping your customers? So the issue for us is if you're not in our database, which we use as like confirmed RVs, we know that, you know, our product fits this year, make, model, and trim. Um, but there's a lot of RVs that we haven't come across yet. So we do know a series of questions to ask someone about their RV. What's your leveling system? Uh, what size is the leveling feet on it? What shape are they? How many are there? And we can run them through that. And if they give us the correct answers, we will give them a product recommendation or shut them to a waiting list and say, we don't have anything for that yet. Cool. So do you think there's any other AI use cases when it comes to your business? Yeah, we're looking into AI to supplement customer service, which is a huge uh, piece for us. Definitely. Um, it's one of the reasons we've grown so well. We have take pride in customer service. Plus we need our agents to be well-educated in this rather niche product to a very niche um, industry. <laughs> So we can't just sort of outsource it, uh, which happens a lot, I think, in D2C. That's that's just not an option for us. But we are looking at some platforms now that can create agents that will take a lot of the sort of day-to-day -day stuff off of our, our human agents' plates so they can focus more on, you know, the deep sort of connections that some people need to make in order to make the decision about a product or troubleshoot it and stuff like that. So do you have like a live phone line where your customers are calling in and asking questions about your product? Absolutely. And uh, as you can imagine with RVing, there's a big baby boomer sort of segment to it. And they're much, you know, some of them are much more comfortable calling on the phone than, than messing around with any sort of <laughs> technology. That's more, yeah, that makes sense. I think 100%. I think it's like folks that are in my generation, younger people in their 20s, 30s. Like, yeah, I don't even want to speak to anybody. But like, you know, right. it's like my parents they would call 100%. Oh, yeah. We have people still call us and say, I just want to give you my credit card over the phone. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot more secure online. You don't know who I am. But, um, yeah, they're just more comfortable doing that. So when they're calling, it's not you answering. You have folks that are working for your company, right? Yeah, it's my wife and her, her team. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. So that she's a customer service. So in, yeah. in, in terms of marketing, you know, what – platforms have been the most efficient for you when you partner with these influencers? Uh, YouTube is actually our big one. So Instagram is kind of second, but YouTube is probably our top awareness channel right now. Even though we don't spend, um, we don't pay to be on YouTube. It's just through the influencers. Uh, but the good thing about YouTube is one, almost every RVer is on there because there's a lot of education and do it yourself to the community and to that lifestyle. So there's just a lot of that stuff that lives on YouTube forever. But the good thing about us is as we get more and more of those people doing reviews or installs, is uh, it compounds over time because it's just there's 10 of them and then there's 30 of them and then there's 100 of them. So we become ubiquitous on the platform for any RVer who's looking for stuff. Whereas something like Instagram is a lot more feed-based, right? So even if something goes viral, it's gone in a day or a week or a month, whereas YouTube that stuff kind of lives forever. That's awesome. I think you're one of the first people, like it's just, you know, based on what you're doing, it's like very few companies are, you know, able to, to be successful with these kinds of like long form videos. Cause like most of the companies that we speak with, Oh yeah, it's all about TikTok, Instagram reels. It's like, there's no attention span, but like what you're really focused on are these like cool long form visit people using your product. It's like a 30 minute, one hour YouTube video where people see that. Okay. Now like, I want to go buy it. Yeah, it's, it's all about, because as I said, they're educating themselves on how to use 
an equipment or where to go. So yeah, it, it could be a 15 minute install video and they say, this is how I did it. And this is how it's working. And yeah, they eat it up. Awesome. So what would you say is your top business priority in the next three to six months? Uh, we're kind of at the point where we, we really want to scale aggressively. So for years, the first few years, you know, we did more than double in size for the first or in terms of revenue first three years, I think, uh, sequentially. But um, the issue with our industry is we kind of reach a plateau for every kind of leveling system there is. So our first product is probably relevant for about 15% of the market. And then our next product was probably re relevant for 3% of it. So there was all these little chunks that we had to make different pads for. And now we're kind of up to about 90, 95%. The first few, three years, we either hit ceilings because we didn't have the right product um, done or our, our manufacturer just couldn't make it fast enough. So we've spent years building up a supply chain and um, developing new products. And we're kind of at the point now, okay, how do we scale this aggressively um, moving forward? So you, you mentioned uh, manufacturing, and that's like a very interesting point because you started in your garage, as you said. So how have you been able to find these right manufacturing partners that have helped you make the product in high volume, good quality products? I think so many companies struggle with that. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a significant challenge just because when we found our manufacturer, it was a long search. It was probably about a year for the first one. And we just found a rubber manufacturer in the U.S., who was willing to take a chance. He said, I can make this. I know you don't have any orders. You know, you're not an established company, but you know, the per part price will be this and you know, let's see what happens. So uh, we did start selling obviously right away, but he was a much bigger outfit. So he had a lot of major accounts that he was. So, um, you know, we'd sell, I don't know, $5,000 worth of stuff in a month and he wouldn't invoice us. He just wouldn't bother. And then $6,000 the next month and then he wouldn't invoice us. So, the funny thing is, is we didn't have to pay our cogs very much for the first year and a half because this guy uh, just didn't bother invoicing us. So we would, we'd have cash in hand from sales and we weren't paying to make the product, um, which was good until uh, we started scaling. His operation kind of, the pandemic hit, his operation kind of honestly folded. So that manufacturer went out of business in 2021 and we were stuck in 2020 up here in Canada, nobody can travel and we had to source new manufacturers for this now established product. And we were making, you know, we had to make tens or even hundreds of thousands of units a year at this point. And we had to do it remotely. So we had to call people, we had to describe to them what we were doing, send them, you know, emails with PDFs of the tools we were using, uh, have them make a sample, send it to us over uh, the mail, wait weeks for it. Um, it took us two years almost to, to get the, a real robust supply chain. And I think we went through four or five different manufacturers before settling on the two that we have now. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it kind of makes sense that he went out of business if he wasn't invoicing you. Right. Well, that, that's the thing. Like it was, it was a boon for us early on, but it was also a red flag for, uh, when we were <laughs> a bigger company, right? Yeah, Which, was, uh, tough yeah. lesson to learn, but you know. It is what it is. Yeah, he was like, what happened to our, uh, you know, payroll? He's like, well, I was never, you know, I was never sending invoices. Yeah, we were, um, when the pandemic hit, we had to turn off all marketing, all direct to consumer. And we were 40,000 units back ordered by, I think, the start of 2021. Because we were on the channel by then. So we had wholesale orders coming in. So oh, how are you, yeah, no, exactly. So I guess I wanted to know, like, how, like, how were you able to survive? Because I feel like, you know, that can really set companies back and, you know, shut them. I mean, COVID was a weird time. Like, how were you able to manage, like, really surviving and thriving through that? Uh, lots of praying. <laughs> Honestly, um, we took some loans and we got a, a bridge loan from the business development uh, here in Canada. So the BDC, which is the good thing is, is we had so much momentum heading into the pandemic that we had enough you know, revenue and history that they could look and go, okay, well, this is, this is a thing. Uh, and of course the pandemic was so strange that you couldn't really hold uh, what was happening against us from a business perspective. But yeah, it was just a lot of grinding, showing up, not really knowing what's happening. Uh, you know, our, 
our manufacturer did continue to try to make stuff up until he went out of business in 2021. So we were getting dribs and drabs from him, but um, it was enough for us to send our wholesale orders usually three or four months late. So that was some uh, cash flow that we had. And then we got up sort of back up and running the, by the middle of 2021 with new producers. And by the start of 2022, that's when um, we were sort of back on our feet. So what is the one biggest piece of advice you wish you knew before you started this company? Whew, yeah, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> yeah, which, because there's a lot, there's a lot that we've learned. Uh, one of them was, if you're an entrepreneur getting into things and you're just trying to get on your feet, you don't tend to pay too much attention to things like finance, like real bookkeeping, real finance. Um, you're just worried about, are people buying it? And can we make money every day? And we were the same, you know, first year or two it was, we had a, a part-time bookkeeper. She would come in once a month and sort of do our books just enough so we could give it to an accountant at the end of the year, that type of thing. But once we started getting into real business, we had to clean that up really badly. Like it was, uh, I think it was probably 12 to 18 months of going back and going, wow, this was bad. This is wrong. And especially because, uh, we don't, developed a lot of bad habits around not having to pay cogs <laughs> and getting invoices that were sort of written on napkins almost from from our manufacturer. So, you know, learning cash conversion cycles, learning um, inventory management, um, forecasting cash, like all, all that becomes extremely valuable because if you don't, if you're making cash, but you don't know where it's going or if you're actually making a profit, uh, you can go out of business really quickly. That makes sense. So if we're going to have this conversation again in one year from now, where do you yeah. expect things to go for your business? Well, I'm hoping that we'll be up, let's see, 20 to 40% over this year. Uh, I'm hoping that we're, we've launched a new tent pole product. So what we're doing is we're starting to advance the catalog beyond permanent jack pads into other leveling so we can now sort of start expanding LTV because with our product, which is made out of recycled rubber tires, um, it's kind of a one and done for, unless you buy another RV or you, <laughs> you scrape them off somehow in a, in a terrible accident, you know, you don't need, we, we've sold stuff to people in 2015 who still have them on their RV. So we do want to now start developing cross-sell and upsell, upsell uh, catalog. So I'm hoping the the major temple product for that will be out by this time next year. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you, do you mind sharing your website and social media handles? Yeah. So we're at rvsnappad.com. That's usually, that's us on YouTube, TikTok, and uh, Instagram as well. And I'm on Twitter a lot, actually, at Kent uh, underscore Wilson. Awesome. Well, Kent, thank you so much for your time. We're rooting for you hopefully one year. We can you know, chat again as you guys keep growing your company. Yeah, fingers crossed. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining. All right, thanks. Yep. Bye. Bye.